okay so let's continue our discussion and let me summarize what we obtained so far okay so far we have been studying correlation functions of operators that belong to a conformal field theory operators are uh, organized in a reducible representation of, of the conformal symmetry. And we have seen that these, uh, um, these reducible representations are identified by the quantum numbers of the primary operator, which is an operator annihilated by the generator of special conformal transformation. And these quantum numbers can be identified as a scaling dimension and the irreducible representation of the rotation that for what concerns us will be only will be always be um, a traceless symmetric uh, tensor with L indices. Okay? So generically, I will denote operators like this. They have their own, uh, their own argument, and they will have, uh, of course, they will have indices that I'm suppressing. And we have been studying op uh, the, um, correlation functions of of these uh, of these operators. And we, ob we have obtained very important results. In particular, I never mentioned it, but one thing that you can show is that the one-point function of operators uh, in a conformal field theory should be zero because it cannot depend on the, on, the, on the coordinate because of translation invariance. And so this has, has to be a dimension full quantity. You don't have scales in your theory, so it has to be zero. <coughs> um, and we also obtain that two-point functions of these operators are diagonal, meaning that only two-point functions of the same operators are non-zero. And this is fixed by conformal symmetry. No, I'm not going to write the expression. And it's fixed, and you can take the norm to be positive. Well, you can take the, 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 cof the coefficient in front of this fixed uh, tensor structure to be 1. This is just a, a choice of redefinition of the field. But then, if you uh, fix the, the, um, the norm of the primary operator, then the requirement that all the descendants, meaning all correlation function of operator of the form, let's say, d mu o delta l to some power. Okay, let's call it d to the n, d to the n. Okay, uh, the requirement that this correlation function is positive when inserted at specific point which are reflection po re reflection one of the other okay and generically you should take the well let's write like this to be more to be more precise okay and the norm of this to be positive <coughs> we have seen that this implies very important constraints on the dimension of the operator and so we obtained a so-called unitarity bound, which I recall for you. Um, delta has to be can be zero if L equals zero. And this corresponds to the identity operator. So meaning that only the only the vacuum is invariant under both rotation and, and dilatation. And delta has to be larger or equal than d minus 2 over 2 when L is equal to 0. So scalars has to be larger than this dimension. And then delta has to be larger or equal than L plus d minus 2 when L is larger, strictly larger than 0. These are the unitarity bounds. And then we introduced uh, another concept, which is the operator product expansion. And the operator product expansion is the statement that 
if you have two operators, uh, O1, O2, okay, and with generic quantum numbers, you can write inside any correlation function, you can write this, uh, you can replace these two operators with an infinite sum of uh, a coefficient c 1, 2, k, which depends on, let's say, the difference of the coordinate, x minus y, and then derivative with respect to y, and then a gen another operator, k, inserted at y. This is one way to state it. You can, you can insert the operator uh, anywhere, uh, and, and, and then you have to modify accordingly this, uh, this prefactor. Uh, <coughs> an important statement is that this, this is an equality that holds in inside correlation function. And you might ask when so this is an infinite sum, and you may ask when does the, this uh, uh, expansion converge? When, the, when does it converge? And the statement is that you can do this as long as uh, you have a sphere that contains the two operators and no other operator. So let's, let's make a cartoon. Okay, this is your O1, O2, and then you have other operators, O3. Let's say, as long as you can, cr you can draw a sphere that contains these two operators but no other operator, then this expansion is legitimate. The moment you, 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 your sphere includes an, a, a third operator, then this expansion is not not valid anymore. And if you remember, and the reason is goes back to how we define the operator product expansion because this this product of operators defines a state on the sphere, and of course if the sphere contains a third operator, then uh, you're not representing uh, the, regional, the regional state anymore, you're representing something else. So you cannot, you cannot expand in this way. Okay? And so now that we are equipped with this uh, very powerful uh, statement, which is called operator product expansion, Basically, we have a tool to compute any correlation function in terms of smaller correlation function. So if you have, let's say, a three-point function, as we saw yesterday, uh, one of x1, o2 of x2, o3 of x3, you can start taking operator product expansion of um, let's say the first two, and write this as an infinite sum, but uh, of two-point functions. Okay, so this will be an infinite sum over k, c1 two k uh, of x1 two, derivative respect to two of ok to x2 o3. But then, because we choose, in our first blackboard, we choose correlation function to be uh, diagonal, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, infinite, su infinite sum actually reduces to a single, s to a single term, which is uh, 1, 2, 3, x1, 2, d2, o3, uh, x2, o3 x3. Notice that um <coughs> the, the operator O3 might not appear in the operator product expansion. Okay, this is a this is an expansion in terms of a complete basis, but sometimes one of the one of the, the vector of your basis does not enter in the expansion. And in that case you simply get zero. Okay. And also, we um, <coughs> yesterday, by matching 
these two sides of the equation, you can sort of define what this, um, this differential operator is in terms of uh, the, the three-point function coefficient. So we have seen yesterday that, for instance, that C1 to 3 is proportional to the three-point function coefficient, which is defined to be f1 to 3, which is the one that appears when you define the three-point function. So this would be f1 to 3. Uh, and then there is a numerator, a denominator, which is totally fixed by conformal symmetry. And so because uh, the, this, this, t this tensor structure here, or uh, generically, there could be some tensor here, uh, which takes care of, uh, one, two, three, that takes care of the indices, okay? Uh, for scalars, there is no tensor. For, for a spinning operator, there would be a tensor. So let's do scalars for, for simplicity. And this, this quantity here is completely fixed up to this uh, coefficient, which means that also the differential operator is completely fixed. Okay, so this is also completely fixed by conformal symmetry. Uh, what is not fixed are the, the prefactor, which, which in turn coincides with the three-point function coefficient. And so the statement that an operator does not appear in, inside an OPE uh, is equivalent to say that the three-point function of an operator with the, other, with, the, with the original two is zero. Okay, so if f123 is zero, then the operator three does not enter in the OPE of one with two. To restate this, uh, normally we write uh, with the note uh, OPE like this, with an X. Okay. Let's say O1, O2. Okay. This, this means operator product expansion. This contains uh, operator O3 if and only if the three point function uh, O1, O2, O3 is non zero and vice versa. Okay. So for instance you can ask um <coughs> what kind of operators do I have uh in the in the OPE of two scalars, two identical scalars? This is a simple question that you can ask. So consider a scalar phi with dimension delta and then you take the operator the OPE one, the OPE with the same operator, with the same scalar at position zero, for instance. Okay, so I can really remove this. Let's consider this quantity, and then you can ask, uh, in this OPE, what do I have? Okay. And <coughs> there are several ways to, to uh, to answer this question, one, question one, one way is to look at which kind of three-point function can exist that are non-zero between two scalars and the third operator. Okay. And if you remember, so one way, uh, they, are two, uh, they are equivalent. Okay. Uh, one way is to look at uh, the three-point function phi phi O delta, uh, well, OK. Okay, generic, and <coughs> because of conformal symmetry, this is uh, I can al I can always reduce myself to a configuration where um, the operator are inserted in this particular way, uh, so phi of x, phi of minus x. O of zero. Okay. You can always shift and resize 
and the, th the two things will be related. So I shift such that the third operator is at zero, then I, uh, I, can, I can put things on the line using conformal transformation because given three points, there, are al there is always a circle passing from three points. So I could use a, co a special conformal transformation to open the circle to a line, and then I can resize the line so that they are in this, uh, in this configuration. And so this means that this object here uh, can only depend on x. It can depend only on a single vector. Okay. And I have to construct a tensor out of a single vector. And the only tensor that I can construct are traceless symmetric tensor. So the tensor structure that can appear here can only be of the form, if you want, x mu 1, x mu n, and eventually, if I want it to be irreducible representation, I have to subtract traces. But this is the only divided, of course, by the, the appropriate denominator. But this is the only tensor structure you can construct out of the single vector, which means that the only representation in which O can transform is a traceless symmetric. Okay. You can repeat the argument using the uh, starting from the OPE, okay? Because on the OPE you have to create something with on the other side. So uh, the, the other way would be to start from from this. And then you have to create an object which is uh, a scalar. And you, uh, and you can only contract the indices of an operator that appear with x, with eventually many x's, but the only way you, you can do that is to, to construct things like this. Uh, mu1, x mu n, oh, mu1, mu n, minus traces. And so the only thing that you can, you can appear on, this, on, this other, on the right-hand side is, again, a trace asymmetric operator. Actually, you can do better than that. Uh, you can show that because of uh, because the, the, these two operators are identical, um, if you permute them, it's like changing x to minus x, which means that um, this triple function has to be invariant and for x going to minus x. And if you look at the the right hand side, the only way that this can be invariant for, uh, for x going to minus x if you have uh, an, e an even number of x's. So you can do better than that. Not only has to be traceless symmetric, but uh, with L even. So in the OPE of two identical scalars, you can only have scalars, spin 2, spin 4, spin 6, and so on and so forth, but no other operators. You cannot have mixed symmetry uh, operators. You cannot even have a current okay, in, the, in the OPE of two identical scalars. Is this clear? Yes. Uh, well, once you have a symmetric operator, you, can you have to decompose it. Other questions? So this was an example of how, uh, starting from um, a three-point function, you can, you can reduce to a two-point function uh, in, in this example. This uh, method is very generic. So in principle, I can start from any correlation function and use the op operator prototex function iteratively to reduce uh, the, the, the form of the correlation function to a smaller one. Even though in principle this is doable, in practice it's very hard to do it. But nevertheless, it allows me to give a definition of <coughs> all the information that you need in principle to reconstruct, to compute any observable in, quantum fi in a conformal field theory. So, uh, what I would like to do to 
to define now is the content of a CFT, okay? what is usually called the CFT data. So in order to uniquely specify the conformal field theory in the bootstrap approach, you don't need Lagrangians, you don't need ultraviolet description, you don't need anything of that. You only need a set of, uh, an infinite set of operators because they had to describe a Hilbert space. So uh, which, which, pr which uh, a set of dimension and, and let's say generically spin in a CFT, you won't have only uh, tracer symmetric operators. You'll, you'll, you will have a whole generically all representations because combining tracer symmetric, you can generate all possible representations. Well. <coughs> Except uh, spin Orial one. So uh, the CFT data will be a set of uh, delta and S which are associated basically to two-point functions of operators. Okay. Which are completely fixed by, by symmetry. Fixed. And then <coughs> the other ingredient that you need, uh, this is a spectrum if you want, or equivalently the operator content. This is sufficient to compute two-point functions, but if you want to start computing higher point function, you also need uh, the operator product expansion coefficient. Or equivalently, the three-point functions. So all possible o I, O, J, O, K. This will be some F, I, J, K. <laughs> All possible uh, three-point function that you can construct out of, this of these operators, you take any three of them, you can construct a three-point function, you have to specify what is the, um, the three-point function coefficient, and this in turn corresponds to specifying the operator product expansion of any two pair, of any pair of, uh, of operators. Once you have this, this is called the CFT data. You can, con you can construct any correlation function simply using the OP. Use OPE. Everything. And, and I will show this in a second. Any questions about the, the ingredients that we need? So this, is a, of course, is in principle. Then in practice, to do computation, you have seen that it's very hard. You will see that it's very hard to, to go through this, this procedure. So let's do a concrete example, OK? Let's study four-point functions. which we have never encountered so far. And in particular, of scalars. I will restrict myself to scalars. Okay. So the very first question that you might want to ask is, if I consider a four-point function of uh, one, or two, or three, or four of scalars, um, are there any constraints coming from the covariant properties of this correlation function? Okay. And generically, there are. Let's see if I have. Okay, so you can study as uh, very much like we did in uh, for 
two-point function and three-point function, you can go in the embedding space where conformal transformations are realized linearly, and you can try to study what is the most general form of uh, a correlation function consistent with this with the symmetry, and then uh, you will come up with some answers. However, um, even though you you can manage to to find um, a form that takes care of the covariant properties, we know already that this uh, this four-point function cannot be fixed uh, completely. And the reason, if you remember, is that there are two conformal invariants that you can construct out of two points. So whatever, even if you, you, you manage to find something that takes care of the covariant properties, you might always multiply by a function of these two conformal invariants. And I remind, for you, I remind the definition, these are, U, are called U and V, and they can be written as x12 square, x34 square, divided by x13 square, x24 square, this is U, and similarly, there's another one which is called V, which historically has been uh, written like this, x14 square, x23 uh, square, divided by the same denominator, x13 square, x24 square. Okay, those these are two conformal invariants. They under conformal transformation, they they are simply left untouched. Okay. And so, <coughs> even if you manage to find a prefactor here that takes care uh, of covariant properties, which I will write in a second, you can always multiply this by a function of uv, and this will not alter the, com the, com the transformation property of the four-point function. So we already, uh, we, we already know that the four-point function will not be completely fixed. Okay. So four-point functions are not fixed by conformal symmetry. However, using our uh, strategy, we might hope to be able to compute them uh, starting from uh, the CFT, uh, starting from the knowledge of the CFT data. So let me fill this, uh, this parenthesis here. Uh, I encourage you to do this exercise. And let me just write this for a very specific case in which delta 1 is equal to delta 2 and delta 3 is equal to delta 4. Okay, otherwise, there will be more. It will be, it would be more complicated. In this case, it's very simple. And it simply looks like this. Um, sorry, I want to use uh, another definition. x12 to the 2, uh, let's say delta 1, 1 over x34 to the 2 delta 3. Okay? So this, this prefactor here takes care of, um, of the covariant properties, but then you can always multiply by a function of the conformal invariance. And this energy will do, okay? Energy will, will give you a, a quantity which is consistent with uh, conformal symmetry, okay? Very good. So now let's try to, um, <coughs> to, you to apply our uh, machinery and, and see what kind of expression do we get. We know that whatever we get has to be has to look like this, but let's let's go ahead. Mm. Okay. 
So let me start from a case of uh, four operators. Okay, and <coughs> I will start. Um, I will assume that I can I can perform an operator prototype function of the first two and of, and three and four. Okay, and this is this, this is true if the operator are in such a way that, for instance, you can uh, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. Okay, if this is the case, then you can draw uh, a sphere around the first two. A sphere around the other two, and then you can you can use the operator product X function. So if we do that, this will, be will result into a double sum generically. But because I anticipate that the double sum will collapse to a single sum because uh, only the diagonal term will survive. So we write a single sum of OP coefficient, which I will call uh, lambda now, or I can continue calling them f, 1, 2, k, from the first OP, then will be an f, 3, 4, k, from the second OP, and then eventually there is some, some, some quantity, which I will call w, k, and this is, um, and which depends on the coordinate. Okay. Yes? Um, in order to perform the operator products function, they don't have to overlap. Um, I'll I come to the radial quantization in, in, in a while, but this simply tells you that uh, if you have two operators, you can draw a sphere. On, this, on, this, on the boundary of the sphere, you have a state. And then you take the scalar product of this state with another state defined on the other boundary. So basically, it's, uh, you're computing the path integral over here with boundary conditions on the two spheres. They don't, well, at some point, they, will, they can overlap. Uh, but they don't have to. I mean, you can, you can literally take the smallest. You can take even something like, well, yeah, you can even take something like this, OK? As long as it contains the two operators. The important point is that this sphere does not contain any other operator. No, they don't have to overlap. It's it's like in flat space. Okay, you have a let's say you have operators like this, and then you can draw lines. Okay, and these two operators define a state here. These two operators define a state there, and then in the between you stick an evolution operator and you you compute the scalar product. And here the same. Okay, you have two spheres. You have the path integral that connects them. So this this quantity here is called uh, partial wave usually. <coughs> okay and okay and what is this? Um, well, eventually this this quantity here. Um, well, one way to rewrite this is uh, <coughs> sum over k, c12, k, x12, d2, c34, uh, k, x34, uh, d4, and then two point function, ok. Uh, x2, OK of x4. 
Okay, so you can press. And you remember these are proportional to the Fs. So, uh, the partial wave is whatever you get out of this expression once you have stripped out the OP coefficient. Okay. Um, <coughs> and notice that because you can sh you can show, I mean, it's very easy that each one of these k have each one of these k has the same um, covariant properties of the original four-point function. I mean, you can see from here it's just a sum with coefficient in front. So each one of them uh, has the same uh, covariant properties. You can you can show it from here. This object here uh, behaves like a four-point function. It has the same covariance uh, transformation properties under conformal transformation. And so you can, we can write, a convenient way to write is, is to strip out, to strip off um, the, a prefactor, that, that prefactor, which I would call a kinematic prefactor, K4 of xi, times some, uh, a function which is, a function which is, uh, has to be a function of the, the conformal invariant and generically depends on the quantum numbers of the operator OK. So there will be delta K, and say, um, if we are, since we are studying scalars, the, in the OPE, as I showed you before, there can only be traceless symmetric operators, so uh, identified by some index LK. And what is this schematic prefactor? Well, it's just this, in the case of, again, delta 1 equal delta 2, Delta three equal delta four. Uh, K four of x i is just one over x one two to the two delta one uh, x three four to the two delta uh, three. Okay. I'm, I'm using this specific case just to, to show you how it goes, but yeah, it's, not very, it's not much more complicated to, to use generic dimension. You just have powers of uh, x1, one, x13, one, x1, 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 x3, x34 to the difference of delta 1 minus delta 3, delta 4, delta 3 minus delta 4, and, and so on and so forth. So this just simplifies a little bit the expression. And so this, so this is a partial wave. Instead, this object here is called conformal block. block. So a conformal block it encodes the contribution to the four-point function of an irreducible representation. This sum here is a sum over primaries that appear in the OPE. And all the descendants are encoded in the derivatives here. So the sum is re literally on primaries only. And this conformal block resums, so encodes for you, the contribution in this, in this, in this expansion, in this operator product expansion uh, of the whole tower of primary and descendants. Okay? So it's a very important object to to understand. Are there questions about this definition? Okay. Good. So um, perhaps I should Mm -mm -mm. 
perhaps I should uh, spend a few words about where this, uh, this expansion converges. As I said, it converges whenever you, uh, you, you, you your sphere, the sphere surrounding two points does not cross uh, um, a, third, a third operator. And so let's go, for instance, to uh, one of our convenient frames. Uh, if you remember, uh, given four points, you can always put them in the configuration where x1 is in 0, x3 is in 1, and x4 goes to infinity. And then the third operator will be, we have to some uh, coordinate in Euclidean, in Euclidean would be a complex coordinate, z, okay? And this z is related to u by this uh, relation. Okay, so this is the meaning of z. And you can ask when, um, when does the, the <coughs> so z going to zero corresponds to taking x2 very close to x1. So it, z going to zero is the, probes the, the limit of the first two operator very nearby. And then you can start uh, um, considering larger and larger values of z, but then the moment z crosses one, in, in this configuration you are including a third operator in your sphere. So the region of convergence is, it would be this. Uh, but we will see that actually there is a larger domain of convergence of the, of the expansion. You can, you can make, it will be convergent in the whole plane except this line. This line will be a cut. But we will see that later. Okay. Okay, so now I would like to discuss how we compute these conformal blocks because doing uh, as much as this uh, representation is very intuitive, uh, it's, very, it's very ugly because if you remember yesterday, computing this, one, this C1 to K or C3, 3, 4 K, it's a, it's a pain already at the, at the first order. Okay? So if you try to compute the C's uh, order by order in X uh, by matching to the three-point function, you're going to give up very soon. So there should, uh, there should be a better method to compute the conformal blocks. And I would like to discuss two of them today. The first method is called uh, the Casimir method. So, <coughs> Casimir equation, if you want, for the conformal blocks. And the idea is the following. First of all, let's let's go back to our radial quantization picture, in which um, we can take, for instance, a configuration in which the so we have this our space, and we have let's say we have the operator x1, sorry, o1 and o2 here, and we have the operator o3 and o4. Okay, something like this, and then we can draw, we can take uh, as origin of our quantization, let's say some point that allows me to draw a sphere that surrounds the first two points and lives outside the other two points. And so, by radial quantization arguments, we know that 
the insertion of the, two, of the first two operators on the sphere defines, uh, so inside the sphere defines a state on the sphere, which is uh, 01, 02, let's call it like this. Okay. And on the other hand, the other two operators are outside the sphere. So they also define uh, a state on this sphere, but in the other, uh, so they define they a state, a conjugate state, if you want. Okay? So if they were inserted inside, they would, it would, they would define O3 or O4, but because they are outside, they define, let's say, on this sphere here, they define the operator, the conjugate operator, O3, O4. Now you, you can take them together, and so the correlation function that we, we are studying in radial quantization can be interpreted as computing the, uh, the probability to transit from a state O1, O2 to a state O3, O4. Okay. This is what we are computing. And we have seen that this object here admits an expansion um, in terms of partial waves. The one, two K, sorry, F, F three, four K, W K. Okay. So the uh, one thing that I would like to do is to isolate uh, a single contribution in this sum. And the way to do this is to insert here, if you want, a complete set of states. So I want to introduce one as a sum over k of um, projectors on irreducible representations. Okay. So this will be PK will be a, pro a projector on, in the re on, on an irreducible representation. Okay. And so, by this argument, WK, sorry, uh, if you want, F1, 2, K, I will, I will write what is F PK in a second, okay? Um, F1, 2, K, F3, 4, K, WK can be written as the projector PK sandwich between these two states. O1, O2, O3, O4. Okay. And what is PK? Well, PK is, is a projector on a reducible representation. So it's a sum over all possible states in, the, in, the, in, in an irreducible representation uh, normalized. Okay. So I will write PK as as sum over all states that are in the in the irreducible representation of uh, of a primary OK, so there will be OK itself. There will be P OK, sorry, it's been more clear. Will be P new OK, P mu P new. Okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, this is a very long sum. And then I have to uh, add the projector. So there would be alpha. Sorry, this, is, this will be uh, actually, will be a metric, okay? Uh, sum over alpha, beta. Alpha, beta. Okay, <coughs> and then I have to divide by the norm of of the of the um, of the state, so I will divide by the inverse of the gram matrix. What is the gram matrix? The gram matrix is basically the scalar product alpha beta. Okay, so you you might be familiar with this formalism from from quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, this is a projector on state of on a reducible representation properly normalized. Um, it's important that normally 
you don't you don't write this this term you just uh, you just uh, diagonalize terms but here I, I really want to identify alpha and beta with uh, primary descendant and then you have to remember that pr a primary it's true that the primary has uh, um, it's true that sorry two-point function are diagonal but not uh, inside the same representation okay in particular a primary can have a two-point function with uh, not only with the primary, but also with the descendant. Questions? Okay. Very good. So we have identified the partial wave, or the conformal block, uh, with a sum with a set of um, matrix element of the projector with the two states, uh, with two states. And now <coughs> I will do the following trick. I will insert in this, um, in this correlator, uh, I will insert the Casimir operator. So what is the Casimir operator? The quadratic Casimir operator is basically the sum is the square of the, the sum of the generator. Okay, so um, if you remember uh, my definition of generators of S O D uh, plus one comma one J A B J A B. Okay, so these are the generators, generators of um, S O D plus one comma one. And <coughs> if you, if you remember from your quantum mechanics courses, if you have rotation, you take the square of the sum of of the generators like this. Um, you just you get something which is you get an operator which commutes with all generators of the uh, of the algebra okay, and, and then by sure lemma it has to be proportional to the identity so the, the action of the co of this op of this casimir operator inside an irreducible representation is uh, proportional to the identity so in particular, this means that if I insert this operator here, it will, give, it will just give me a number. So let me do that. I take 03, 04, uh, PK, then I insert the Casimir operator, and then sandwich between also 01, 02. And then I can do two things. I can either act on the left or act on the right. Okay. If I act on the left, this is an, uh, these are all state in the same irreducible representation. So for any state in this sum, I will get the same number. And the number is, uh, so for, from one side, I will just get a number which I will call C delta L times the same object uh, without C2. Okay, and this C delta L is, is the Casimir again value, which for traceless symmetric operators looks uh, very sim uh, something like this delta, delta minus D plus L, L plus D minus two. Okay. This is when I act on the left. Now let me act on the right. Okay. And when I act on the right, um, because it's acting on operator which is defined as the 
two fields acting on the vacuum, I can take the commutator with these operators and implement um, So let me um, <coughs> let me consider what is this. Okay, C two of uh, one O two. Um, this can be written as um, J A B J A B O one of x1, O2 of x2 on the vacuum, right? And then I can start commuting stuff. Of course, when I get uh, J acting on the vacuum, I just get zero because it's, uh, the vacuum is invariant. So I can, I, can always, um, I can always substitute this with the commutator, for instance. Sorry. First of all, let me let me tell you what is JB. Uh, So I should, uh, let me. Hmm. How should I do that? Uh, let's do it in step, okay? So JAB of O1 of X1. O2 of X2. So this JB acts on both of them. So it's actually a sum. Okay? So this object is um, it's JAB, if you want, acting on point one, plus JAB acting at point two. Okay? And so if I take the commutation, so this can be written as, if you want, Um, let me show this. Okay. One sec. So I can take the commutation relation, for instance. Um, I can start commuting J B with the with the with the operators, and what I get, I get that this is J A B O one X one. O2 of X2 plus the other one, um, O1 of X1, JAB, O2 of X2 acting on the vacuum. Okay? And so now you can um, represent the action of the generator with a differential operator. Okay? This we gets something that we, uh, we defined in the first lecture. So this, this differential operator here, I will call it uh, Carly L or Carly D, even better. Differential operator acting at point one plus uh, with indices AB plus differential operator acting at point two with indices AB. And then O1 of X1, uh, O2 of X2 on the vacuum. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, the action of, of a single one is a differential operator to different points. And so now you do it twice, and so you, you obtain that the Casimir acting on the state of one 
um, acting on 1 of x1, O2 of x2 on the vacuum can be written as some complicated differential operator, capital D, which acts on both points. Okay, it doesn't factorize when, of course, when you when you multiply. Um, acting on 1 of x1 um, <coughs> or 2 of x2 back here. okay so we you can you can we can find this differential operator I'll write it in a second but this is the this is what you get okay and here I've been using the fact that generators can be represented as differential operators so let me conclude uh, and then we take a break for uh, using the fact that you can either act on the left or act on the right, we can write a differential equation that the four-point function has to obey. So I have that... Uh, I have a differential operator acting at point one two, uh, acting on this four point function, um, which I wrote like O three, O four, P K, O one, O two. Okay, uh, here arguments are hidden inside the operators, and this has to be equal to some uh, eigen fu eigen function C delta L. Same four point function. O three, O four, PK, O one, O two. Okay. And now we can plug our definition of conformal blocks in terms of uh, of the partial wave. Okay. And we um, we can obtain a differential operator that has to be obeyed by the conformal blocks. So this implies a differential uh, equation for the conformal block G. And you can just plug the definition of W here and get something uh, which is a differential equation for G delta L U B. And this differential equation looks like this one. Uh, <coughs> so, it's, so it's a bit complicated, but um, so it's some differential operator here acting on GUV. Uh, in fact, the, uh, it's better visualized in terms of ZZR. Okay, so this is we can also write at, as a function. Uh, of ZZ bar. Equal C delta L um, G delta L ZZ bar. And this, this differential operator Carly D has a very ugly form, uh, which is the following. Mm. So it's there are a factorized term, this one one differential operator acting only on the variable Z. There's differential operator acting only on the variable C bar. And then unfortunately for us, there is a, a term that mix the derivative and um, it has the following form plus 2 d minus 2 z z bar over z minus z bar 1 minus z dz 
minus 1 minus z bar dz bar. And here dz or dz bar looks like this one. Um, it's 2 z square. Well, let's the, let's call it x, okay? x can be either z or z bar, it doesn't matter. So this will be 2x squared, 1 minus x, dx squared, plus, sorry, minus 2 plus. Eventually, if the, if the external dimension are not equal, you get, you get here differences of the external dimensions. Three, uh, I'm just writing for completeness. Delta 1, 2. This means delta 3 minus delta 4, delta 1 minus delta 3. Uh, x squared dx plus delta 1, 2, delta 3, 4 over 2 x. Okay, so it's a second-order differential equation, d differential operator, in the single variable. Then you have the same in the you have one in z, one in z bar, and then you have this mixed term, which nicely enough uh, vanishes when you are in two dimensions. So you might ex you might expect that in two dimension the solution of this differential equation is somewhat simpler, and indeed it is. Okay, I'll I'll take a break now. Yes. The action on the left. Yes. Uh, here. Left, yes. So um, this PK here is defined. It's not. It's not defined anymore. So this PK here is a sum over states in the in the same irreducible representation. Alpha, beta. Divided by some some norm. Okay. Uh, divided by the norm. Alpha beta. And so you have a Casimir operator acting on, on, a sta on all states in the, say in, the irreduci in the same irreducible representation. And because the Casimir commutes with all the generator, it has to be proportional to the identity in s within uh, an irreducible representation. So they all contribute equally with this factor. <coughs> so they're all eigenstate of the Casimir with this eigenvalue, all of them, because they are in the same this is literally like in the rotation, uh, when, when you consider rotation, you, okay, uh, you can take the L square. Uh, this is the Casimir of rotation, and this is uh, JJ plus 1. Okay, all, all state in the same representation will contribute in the same way. Is this clear? Oh, first of all, this is our mission, so. Uh, Oh, this one. Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, you have to take. You have to remember. Um, you have to remember the definition in terms of the J's, and this will. Uh, if you write in terms of the M dilatation and and so this this is something like now I, I might screw up some some uh, some sign, but it should be something like this M M nu M nu uh, plus or minus here D square, and then plus or minus pk plus kp, something like that. Okay, so uh, you get a combination of uh, l, l plus one from here. Sorry, uh, well, depending on, on, dim on dimension, you get some l dependent factor, you get delta square from here, and then some other factor. Other questions? Yes? Well, uh, historical reason, but mostly because this resembles uh, an expansion in, uh, in an harmonic analysis expansion, basically. <laughs> this is the equivalent of expanding in partial ways when you do the composition of, uh, of, uh, of an object in, uh, in a theory which is rotation invariant. Can we also test the dimension of 
the well, the generic don't what do you mean the generic dimension? Um, no, this is a function. It's a function of two variables. Uh, it's called why it's called block. Uh, it's called block because it packages a lot of stuff together. It's a, it's a chunk of stuff. Other questions? Okay, let's take ten minutes break. Okay, let's continue. So I stopped um, the discussion, but what we did, uh, we managed to prove that if you have a, a four-point function of, four sc of let's say, um, let's do a simple case, identical scalars, For simplicity, this uh, four-point function admits a uh, decomposition uh, thanks to the operator product expansion in the pair one, two, three, four. You have a, a, a sum over all the operators O that appears uh, in the OPE of phi with itself. Okay, and those are traceless symmetric operators. Um, it's better if I put the prefactor in front. So this is one over one over sorry x one one two to the power two delta phi <coughs> x three four to the power two delta phi, and then we have a sum. The prefactor is common. A sum over all primaries appearing in the OPE phi phi of the lan uh, f, the OP, OP coefficient phi phi o, OP coefficient squ square in this case, it's just the same. And then we have a conformal block. G delta O L O, which depends on ZZ bar. And this conformal block satisfies a differential equation, which is the one that I wrote before using the Casimir trick. You have this differential operator D, G delta L, Z must be equal to uh, the Casimir Egan value, C delta L, times the function itself. <coughs> okay, so this is a very important result that we obtain. And this differential equation can be, in principle, be used to define what the conformal block is. This is a second order differential equation. So in order to solve it, you might need um, some boundary condition and uh, the boundary condition that we, are we would like to use are uh, that uh, this conformal block, the behavior at small z and z bar, which corresponds in, um, if you remember, in the plane of z. Here z is a, is a complex variable in Euclidean. This z is one, this is infinity. The small z corresponds to uh, approaching the point, uh, the, po the, the point O1. So um, this is was sorry. This was x1. This was x3 equal one. <coughs> so z going to zero, z z bar going to zero mean uh, that you're taking the appeal, the limit x1, x2 very, very close by, and x4, uh, and x3, x4 very, very close. 
And so in that, in that limit, you can use the OPE uh, with a leading term. And this we can, you can use the expression in terms of this function C1 to 3, C, C, sorry, 1 to K and 3 for K that I wrote before. You can take just the first term and match with the, fir with the first, with the, fir with the leading term of G. Okay, I'm not gonna do that. I'll just give you the result. It's a very simple exercise. And the result is that in the limit <coughs> G delta L, it's easy bar, in the limit of um, ZZ bar going to zero, it should behave like um, some normalization that I'm going to write in a second, which depends on the, 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 the space-time space dimension and the spin. Then there is a leading behavior, which is ZZ bar to the power delta over two. And then, then there is uh, a Gegenbauer polynomial. which uh, if you don't know what it is, you can look, look it up in Wikipedia. It's some specific polynomial, uh, which index L, and has one argument, and in this case the argument is Z plus Z bar divided by two square root of Z, Z bar. Okay, particularly for L equals zero, this is just a constant. It's just one, uh, normalized. So this, sorry, this. Uh, l let me write in the usual, in the usual notation that you find, for instance, in Mathematica or, or Wikipedia. Uh, this would be, it's called C, L, um, and then D over two minus one. Okay. Normally, you find Gegenbauer polynomial with two indices, um, of an argument. The argument. So if if you uh, if you don't know what it is, you can just use Mathematica and it will provide for you the expression. And this normalization here, uh, this normalization is fixed, this is, sorry, this is not, uh, this is times, uh, okay, it's not, a, it doesn't have an argument. This, norm this normalization is a number and it's totally fixed by your choice of two-point function and three-point function normalization. So in the normalization that I've been using so far, this this n here looks something like l uh, factorial divided by minus two to the l, and then there is a Puckhammer symbol d over two minus one l. Okay, Puckhammer is the ratio of gamma functions. So this is a boundary condition that you can just ob obtain by matching uh, the OP limit on both sides of the, of the uh, fr from from the left hand side of the of the four point of the equation that defines the conformal block. And um, okay, so now we have a, a differential equation with a boundary condition, and we might try to solve this equation. So uh, one of the exercise that we will do this afternoon is to show you uh, how you can get solution of this differential equation. Uh, so for now, let me just give you the result, just to tell you that in some cases you can solve this theory, you can solve this differential equation. And the way to do that is, first of all, to realize that when d is equal to 2, This differential operator is, li is just factorize sum of two differential operators. Okay, so you might expect that solution of the Casimir equation can be written as a, the product of two functions, one that depends on z and one that depends on z bar. So we uh, would like to study first the solution of um,
of the uh, differential equation dz bar some function, which I will call k beta of, of z equal to uh, some eigenvalue. So I want to study eigenfunctions of these differential operators. And a nice to, to obtain solution is to write the, eigen, the eigenvalue in, in the following form. Sorry, here I miss. Uh, where am I? Ah, here. Um, is to write the eigenvalue in the, this form, beta, beta minus 2. Okay, I can always write, uh, I can always find a solution. So I would like to find, uh, um, if you do that, and, y and you look carefully at the definition of, of this differential operator, you would see that it looks remarkably similar to uh, uh, differential equations satisfied by hypergeometric functions. And so it has been realized in 2004 by Dollar and Osborne that the solution of this, of, this, of this differential equation, it can be given in terms of very one single function, which is the hypergeometric function 2F1. So K beta that satisfies this equation is simply z to the power beta half uh, hypergeometric function with arguments beta um, well generic uh, let me let me stick to the case uh, where uh, operators are identical so uh, in that case it should be just be beta over 2 beta over 2 beta and then z Okay, so this function here satisfies this differential equation. And now that you have a, a an eigenfunction of dz, yeah, and, and similarly of dz bar, we can just write the solution of, of a conformal block in two dimension. So the conformal block in two dimension, delta L of dz bar, uh, will be a combination of two such functions, one that depends on b, uh, one that depends on z, and one that depends on z bar, with appropriate uh, values of beta 1 and beta 2. Okay? And the way to, do to, to match the values of beta 1 and beta 2, that this will be k beta 1 of z times k of beta 2 of z bar, but it has to be symmetric. So I'll symmetrize it. It has to be symmetric because if you remember, uh, originally uh, the function was a function of u and v, which are symmetric in the definition of zz bar. So whatever you find, a conformal block has so conformal block can be written as a function of u and v, so it has to be a symmetric function on zz bar. You can always exchange them. So I better um, symmetrize. Okay. And <coughs> generically, there is a prefactor here, which is um, 1 over 1 plus delta. Uh, zero L. Okay, so if you have scalars, you have to divide by by two. If you don't have scalars, you don't have to divide. And beta one and beta two are simply um, where are they? Ah. You can you can match them. Uh, I will. Uh, we will do this af this afternoon. Uh, you can you can find that they are delta plus l and delta minus l. Very simple. Okay. So this afternoon I will show you that this function, uh, sorry, not this afternoon, later th this morning, this function satisfies the, the appropriate differential equation. 
And now that we have the, <coughs> the solution in two dimensions, so these are the conformal block of the global symmetry, global conformal symmetry, okay? Those are not the conformal blocks of Virasoro. Conformal block of Virasoro contains an infinite sum, an infinite, infinitely many terms like this one. Yeah. And they're, very com they're much more complicated uh, than this. Now that we have the solution in two dimension, um, we might use uh, a very simple fact about um, this differential operator in, 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 in higher dimensions. So uh, if you go to d equal four, if you remember this uh, differential operator here can be written as a differential operator dz plus dz bar. And then there was this, this term proportional to d minus two, okay? So you might think that with a slight modification of these ansatz, you might find um, a solution of, of, the, of the differential operator in generic dimension. And this is actually true, okay? Uh, I'll show you that this differential operator satisfies uh, a sort of recursion relation, meaning that given the solution in d dimension, you can obtain the solution in d plus, plus two dimension. But it has to be d plus two, it cannot be d plus one. And so uh, we, will we will see later that we can generate the solution for d equal four with a minor modi modification of, of, this, of these ansatz and the conformal block in four dimension also look very simple. They look something like one over minus two to the L. There is a, a prefactor that basically compensates for the presence of this additional term, which is z, z bar divided by z minus z bar. And then there is a combination of of betas, of k, of k betas. So there is k of delta plus L of z, k of delta minus L minus two of z bar, minus now, because the prefactor is antisymmetric, so you have to antisymmetrize. And this is the conformal block in, in four dimensions, four equal scalar uh, dimensions. Okay. So this, uh, these two, these two objects, uh, these two conformal blocks have been obtained very recently. Okay. Um, everything that I've been saying until uh, an hour ago was basically known since the 70s. Okay. Uh, it was standard material in conformal field theory, especially in two dimensions. The novelty uh, came when people managed to compute these conformal blocks. And this happened only for the first time in 2004 by Dolan and Osborne. Osborne. Okay. This was sort of a uh, breakthrough in, the in, in, in this business. Because now we have a very simple form that you can play with. Okay. Um, are there questions about these, uh, these, der these, these solutions? One question that you might ask, for instance, is why uh, am I solving only in even dimensions, okay? And it happens uh, that the solution of this differential equation is very simple in even dimension, well, simple enough to be written in this, in this nice form. In even dimensions, 
In all dimensions, it, apparently, no one has been able to solve this differential equation. And uh, a similar story goes in the, if you try to, to do, uh, to compute eigenfunctions of, of the Casimir operator for, for spherical harmonics. Okay? It's, uh, there is a difference between even and all the dimensions. Um, so, so far, uh, no one has been able to, co to solve this differential equation in, uh, in three dimensions, for instance. Um, but there are other ways to compute the conformal blocks that I would like to discuss. Um, okay. Okay, so the other method that I would like to discuss is called uh, the radial expansion. Uh, I'll just start it and then com continue uh, in the next hour. So, so far I've been using this very nice, ah, okay, a comment that I wanted to make. Uh, perhaps, uh, so the breakthrough happened because people realized that in the ZZ bar coordinate, uh, the differential equation looked very simple. Uh, it might be that in odd dimension there is a, a different change of coordinate that allows you to write the, the Casimir equation uh, in, a, in a much nicer form. So, this is a very open problem. And speaking of, of coordinates uh, and change of coordinates, I would like to introduce a new set of coordinates. So starting from a configuration of four points, I, would, I can use a conformal transformation to map them, uh, not in the z-plane, but in a sort of different configuration, which is the following. So I'll take a sphere of radius one, And I will map, let's say, point x3 and x4 in this uh, on the horizontal line at point plus one and minus one. Okay. And then uh, the point x1 and x2 will be somewhere inside. And I can choose. Uh, I can center my sphere in such a way that. Uh, they also uh, are di uh, on a diagonal, and then I will put x2 here and x1 here, and I will call this this vector here rho. Okay, so rho um, will be some radius times e to the i uh, theta. Theta is this angle. And so those, those are called polar coordinates uh, or radial coordinates sometimes. And uh, let me also introduce um, eta, which is cosine theta, which uh, I will some, uh, I will use very soon. And you can work out what are what is the, the transformation that that relates the rho coordinate and the z coordinate. So uh, it's very simple z is related to, it's going to be 4 rho, so z complex, we are in Euclidean here, 1 plus rho square, and vice versa, you can write rho as uh, z divided by 1 minus square root of 1 minus z square. And this is the transformation that relates, that connects the one conformal frame, the z conformal frame, to the raw conformal frame. And these choices of, of uh, configurations are called conformal frames. <coughs> okay. Now we would like to revisit our, our radial 
uh, quantization in terms of, the cor of this coordinate. Notice that uh, I can even think, I can even map this configuration to the cylinder by doing the, the usual change of coordinate uh, tau equal log of r. Okay, and then on the cylinder, you will have something like, so you have, sorry, you have points x1 and x3, x3 and x4 inserted at ta time equal to zero, which is radius one. And then you have uh, the uh, point x1, x2, somewhere uh, below. But uh, rotated with respect to the, uh, the direction that connects x3 and x4. Um, in particular, I can call this vector here, I will call it, uh, let me be consistent here. This will be n prime, it's a vector, and on, uh, on the sphere that uh, spans the cylinder, and this vector here will be n. And I have um, phi 2 here. And sorry, x2 here and x1 here. Okay. Good. So now we would like to write um, the, the four point function as, um, again, uh, as a, a, pr uh, a bracket between the state defined on this sphere and the state defined on that sphere. So, um, the four point function is going to be something like phi 3, which is inserted at um, radius 1 or time equal to 0 if you want. Let's, let's use radius 1. And, <coughs> uh, sorry, uh, I want to use this. This will be minus m and, and prime, and this will be n, just prime, to be, to be consistent. Okay, so phi 3 will be, I uh, know oh it was correct, it was correct, sorry, sorry about that. Um, n and, and 3 will be at n prime, phi 4 will be at minus n prime, and then I want to take this, I want to construct this, this, uh, this state with the other state, which is the evolution of the state defined at minus tau somewhere. So this will be um, if you want phi one or phi if if, if they're all the same. Um, tau minus n phi two tau uh, of uh, n. Okay, I want to consider. I'm considering these, uh, the the bracket between these two states, and interestingly, interestingly, I can I can use translation on the cylinder to write this object as uh, inserted on on the same sphere, just by translating uh, translating in tau uh, or translating in in or dilatating in R, okay, so uh, let's use tau everywhere, it's better. Zero, tau equals zero. 
Okay? So now when I use translation in, uh, in tau uh, to, ro to bring this, uh, this state uh, also on, this on the at tau equal to zero, so this will be something like um, e to the tau um, phi one of zero minus n phi two of zero and state like this. Okay. Good. Um, and here I have the Hamiltonian, of course. This is the Hamiltonian of evolution on the cylinder. Okay, and now are the questions about this? Uh, I'm, I'm going slowly because it, it might be uh, slightly unfamiliar. So now um, let's insert, let's say, uh, le you know, since we want to compute conformal blocks, I will do as before. I will insert the projector between these two states. So we'll insert the projector between the state on, on the bra and the cat. So this will be phi one, phi three, zero, n prime phi four zero minus n prime projector uh, on the representation k and then I have uh, e to the uh, tau Hamiltonian um, and then phi um, phi 1 of 0 minus n phi 2 of 0 n uh, okay and then because the Hamiltonian acting on on state basically uh, gives me the energy of the state okay this is what's gonna be if I expand um, if I expand, if, if I remember what definition of this is, this is sum over alpha beta. Yes. Yes. Uh, in radial quantization, is a dilatation. So, is the dilatation. Correct. It's the Hamiltonian of the cylinder, but formally it's a dilatation in radial quantization. Very good. Uh, and th this is actually will come now. Um, so this is this is a sum over alpha beta with this ground this ground matrix. Okay. And now that when the your Hamiltonian acts on the state beta, it gives you the energy of the state, which means basically it gives you the dimension of the state. And the state uh, inside an irreducible representation, the dimension of beta is going to be something like delta plus some n. Okay, so they only have they're equally spaced, and they can only have dimension delta plus n. So this sum over alpha beta simply becomes a sum over uh, states with some with some energy. So uh, let me be a slightly more precise. For instance, I can uh, parameterize this uh, this PK as a sum 
over n. So instead of writing alphabet, alpha beta generic, I'm, I'm writing sum over n, where n is the descendant level. And then there will be also sum over possible spins, which are the spin at the given n. Okay? And <coughs> j here is bounded to be between uh, max of L smaller or equal uh, than J, smaller or equal than L plus N. Okay? Because when you act, so to get a descendant, you have to act with, uh, with translation. So if you act N times with the translation, you can at most increase the spin by N, and then you can decrease it up to zero or, or uh, sorry, L minus M here or L minus N, depending which one is large. Okay. <coughs> and here I have a, a, a sum over states, which I will call delta plus N, J, and then uh, same thing, delta plus N, J. And let me assume that I uh, diagonalize the matrix, and orthonorm I, I'm taking an orthonormal matrix here, an orthonormal basis. Okay because I can do that. Okay, so in, in this picture, it's, it's a slightly more cl clear what is the projector is. And now when I act with the Hamiltonian on this state, I simply get e to the delta plus n, tau. But if you remember that e to the tau is the radius, so, uh, this expansion here becomes an expansion, a sum over n and j, j again in the, in the limit of um, r to the delta plus n, which is the energy, I can put it outside, so this is e to the tau. And then I have the, bra the, uh, the sandwich, the bracket of phi 0 n prime, Okay, so sorry, let, let, me let me erase this. Uh, five, four, zero, minus n prime. And then uh, here I have delta plus n j. And then the other, uh, delta plus n j. Phi one mm, minus n, phi two zero n. Okay, so uh, we we got to this uh, nice expansion, and now what we can realize is that um <coughs> what this can be. Okay, well. The only, so this is going to be uh, an object with J indices and it can only be constructed with the vector N prime. So this is must be proportional to uh, N prime mu, uh, mu 1 and prime mu J minus traces because it's a, uh, a trace symmetric object. Of course, it's not going to be only that, it's, it's going to be proportional to this. And similarly, this one will be the same thing, uh, but constructed vector n instead of n prime. I'm going to have n uh, index up now, because they are contracted, uh, mu1 and mu j minus traces. Okay, also, also this one is going to be proportional. And now, <coughs> there's a nice, a, a ni very nice result, uh, which I don't have time to prove, that if you, if you contract two tensors like this one, uh, the only thing that you get is proportional to uh, a Gegenbauer polynomial. So we, 
the gigabyte polynomial turns out to be again useful. And so here what we get is a sum over n and j, r delta plus n. As, as I said, everything here is proportional, so let me allow for some proportionality, a coefficient omega, which depends on n and j, is a coefficient. And then uh, the contraction of these two tensors give, simply give me, gives me um, the Gegenbauer polynomial which index j and d over 2 minus 1, which depends on <coughs> eta. Sorry, which it depends on n dot n prime, which is eta. Okay, so I'll stop here, but let's uh, let's analyze for a second this this uh, equation. This equation tells me that the conformal block admits an expansion, Taylor expansion, in R whose coefficients are proportional to a Gegenbauer polynomial times a function, which depends on n and j, and eventually all the information about, well, this we also, also depend on uh, the spin, sorry, uh, can also depend on the dimension, of course. Okay? Dimension is not only encoded here, it can also be encoded in, the in, in here. And uh, in the next hour, I will I'll try to show you how we can actually compute these uh, this, um, coefficients. Questions? Yes. It's Gegenbauer. Uh, let me, you want to spell it? <laughs> um, yeah. I have it. Where do I have it? Again, uh, Bauer. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Let's continue at eleven thirty. Okay, let's, let's continue. So in the, pre in the previous lecture, we arrived at this very nice uh, expansion for the conformal blocks. Uh, this expression is telling you that the conformal blocks admit an expansion in terms of the radial coordinate r. Uh, basically, this is a sum over all descendants that, con that contributes to the conformal block. And each descendant is suppressed, the contribution of each descendant is suppressed by an additional power of r in this expansion. And this is completely generic. It doesn't rely on the dimension that of space time that we are using. So perhaps we can use this formula to compute the conformal blocks in the dimensions, in odd dimensions, where a closed form, uh, a very compact closed form expression is not known. So this is precisely what I'm going to discuss now. Uh, I, I would like to discuss two, two methods to compute this coefficient here, omega of n and j, uh, 
that relies on the two different, ver two very different approaches. One is again using the Casimir equation, and the other one is uh, would be a recursion relation that relates, that allows you to construct the conformal blocks iteratively. So the first one uh, I'll just catch, and the second one I'll be a, a little bit more. It will be a, a little bit more detailed. Um, so first of all, let me um <coughs> let me define a quantity. So this is a sort of um, recursion relation. for uh, omega n and j. So this will be a little bit sketchy, but it can be formalized. First of all, let me define a function, uh, f little n and j, which depends on, on r and eta, and is simply r to the n, and then the Gegenbauer, the Gegenbauer polynomial C, J, B over two minus one of eta. Okay, it's a very simple, simple function. And the conformal blocks can be written in terms of F and J. And now we can do a very simple thing. You can prove that any differential operator in R and eta um, acts in a very simple way on this function. So for instance, uh, any you can obtain what is the action of multiplying by r, or what is the function of multi or the action of multiplying by eta, or deriving with respect to r, or deriving with respect to eta. Apply to uh, this function and j r eta. Okay. This will end up in uh, this will be proportional, let's say, in uh, to another function f, with uh, displaced by uh, but in genetically will be a combination, let's say sum over m prime and j prime of functions f of the form n plus m prime, j plus j prime, in the same argument. Okay. Uh, you can see it very well that if you multiply by r, it's equ equivalent to shifting n in n plus one. Deriving respect to r, it's equivalent to uh, decrease n to n minus one uh, times, uh, times n. And similarly, you can find uh, very simple formulas for r and d r for multiplying by eta and, and deriving respect to eta uh, using some identities of the uh, Gegenbauer polynomial. Okay. So this goes a little bit beyond, beyond my uh, this lecture, but it can be done. And so because any uh, differential operator can, can be written like this, uh, you can in particular, you can consider the Casimir equation written in terms of r and eta coordinate. You can always make a change of coordinates from zz bar to r and eta. And this, the Casimir differential operator, uh, this d, will map into a differential operator in the variable r and eta, which would be a second order differential operator involving derivative respect to r, derivative respect to eta, and eventually multiplication factors of r and eta. So this means that <coughs> the action of the uh, differential, the, the Casimir differential operator in this coordinate on a conform, um, let's say on a conformal block Um, sorry, um, I should also should also point out that because uh <coughs> because uh, the Gegenbauer polynomial are orthogonal, these functions are orthogonal too. So they are they in a sense they are representing a basis. Okay, so the action 
on a conformal block, g delta l in this variable, uh, minus the Casimir again value acting on the same conformal block. And this equation here can be, uh, by using this property, you can rewrite this, uh, this, uh, this equation as a sort of coefficient multiplying different, different functions. And each coefficient has to be zero independently, okay? Because uh, each, uh, such, each such function is, is indeed orthogonal to the other. And so this one, this crazy differential equation, can be mapped to an algebraic uh, equation of the following form. S uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a very nice exercise to, to do that. The, the only complicated part is to um <coughs> rewrite the differential operator in terms of r and eta. But once you have done that, uh, it's very easy to identify this, this, this condition, and it's very easy to find the equation that I'm going to write. So it's going to be m, a, a sum over uh, m hat, j hat. These are integer numbers that belong to some lattice of points. Okay, um, so this uh, this this s here is going to be a lattice of points of the form um, zero zero. Uh, I don't know, minus one, 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 sorry, minus one, minus one. Okay. And gen generically, for scalars, you can, well, it's not only this, okay, there are many more. And you can show that it contains uh, 30 points. Okay, so all possible, well, so a bunch of combination of, of integers which lies on a specific lattice. In fact, you can even draw this lattice. Um, it looks something like this. Uh, should be m hat j hat. It's something like, so this is, I this is zero, zero, and then uh, there are points like this. And then I think it's something like this, okay? It has a uh, sort of uh, diamond-like shape. So the, que the equation is um <coughs> some coefficient, c, m hat, j hat, which can be computed simply by, by translating this differential equation into a differential equation acting on f times the coefficient omega m plus m hat j plus j hat equal to zero. Okay. It's a very simple algebraic uh, equation and these functions here are functions of uh, delta are known function of delta and, and L. And they are um, <coughs> rational functions of delta and L. And so now you, you see that this, um, this equation here can be used because the, the, the points in, uh, in this lattice here, they, start, they have a zero, zero and all negative numbers in M, they only, they only go in one direction can you can use this relation as a recursion relation to compute the first one as a combination of the others and then you use it again to uh to so you can you can start from this point and again relate it to smaller points and so on and so forth so this can be used as a recursion relation and everything goes back to defining what is um, 
a, a basic, a basic uh, some basic quantities, which are ba which are uh, the omega coefficient when m is equal to zero. And by studying the the limit uh, of the conformal blocks, namely matching with the OP with the OPE expansion, um, you can prove, for instance, that. Um <coughs> Omega zero j uh, is equal to zero has to be equal to zero whenever for j uh, different from l and then omega l is omega zero l is unconstrained it's just the, the overall normalization because everything will be proportional to it and we can set it to for instance to one. So with this, with this sort of boundary condition in the recursion relation, you can iteratively solve for each for any value of, of omega. And so this is a very nice uh, way to compute this using the Casimir equation. And this can be done in any dimension. Of course, this, this coefficient c here also depends on, on the dimension, on space-time dimension. But uh, they, they uh, again, they are rational function of these three variables, so nothing goes wrong uh, in doing it, uh, in doing this exercise in any dimension. And so by by doing this, you can recursively compute the omega, and so you can compute the conformal blocks up to any order in n that you want. You just have to run uh, the recursion relation long enough. So this allows to define conformal blocks as a power series. And the only limitation to compute conformal blocks here is your compu computed power. Because at some point you have to implement this on, uh, on, some, on some notebook. But you, you let it run long enough, and it will compute for you the conformal blocks up to a thousand order. Of course, uh, unfortunately, uh, no one has been able to resum uh, this expression in uh, for generic L, there are closed formulas for for uh, uh, L equal zero and L equal one, but n nothing more than that. Okay, so if you if you feel brave enough, you can try to that. The second method instead uh, uses a completely different approach. In particular, I want to exploit the analytical properties of conformal blocks to define, again, a recursion relation, not for this coefficient omega, which can be recovered in the end, but for the conformal block itself. And it, I want to start with, uh, <coughs> with the definition of conformal blocks that I gave before, um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the projector. So g delta, if you want. Um, the partial wave, I think, was. Um, 1, 2, K, uh, F, 3, 4, K, omega K. I wrote that this is um <coughs> the expectation value of between the state phi, phi 3, phi 4, the projector that I would try to write again as sum over alpha and beta, alpha, beta, divided by alpha, beta, schematically, okay? Generically, this is a matrix, so you have to invert the matrix. And then phi 1, phi 2. So this alpha beta here is the, Im the, the, the inverse of the gram matrix. This represents, this one over alpha beta represents the, gra the gram matrix. And <coughs> so as we, as we saw yesterday, um, whenever the unitarity bounds are uh, obeyed, the 
the gram matrix is definitely positive because all the scalar product, um, if you want, all the states in, the, in this theory have positive norm, which implies when delta is above delta unitarity, um, <coughs> G alpha beta is semi-definite positive. But it happens when, when you hit the unitarity bound, when you saturate the unitarity bound, we saw yesterday that some state becomes a zero norm state. So if, uh, some, uh, if, if, you, if it becomes a zero norm state, you have a pole in this, in this expansion because you have a zero at the denominator or in another way, you cannot convert the gram matrix. And this not only happens at, at the unitarity bound, but it, happe it happens also when delta generically is smaller or equal than delta unitarity. So at, del at delta unitarity is the first descendant for generic L uh, that, that becomes null. For scalars, it's the second descendant. We know exactly what it, what it is. But for delta, uh, going even more uh, below the unitarity, there will be additional states that can become null. So additional descendant. And so uh, um, let me call delta star the star a um, the value uh, of the dimension for which a, des a descendant, not necessarily the first one, becomes null. Okay. So in th at that case, we will have that um <coughs> And I will, I will call this descendant, I will call it operator A, null. Okay, definition. So this, this means that uh, the norm of this operator A as delta approaches delta A star, it should behave something like <coughs> some uh, some quantity which I will call Q A delta minus delta star delta star A. Okay, so um, and here I'm assuming uh, that this um, well at, at least at, at first order this is true. Okay, I'm assuming that the leading behavior is linear, uh, which is all we can show this is always true in odd, dimen in odd dimensions. So from now on, I will work in the odd, which is a case of interest because for d-even, we already know the solution in a closed form. So what, what we're missing are uh, odd dimensions. So this will be the relation. <coughs> and the important observation is that, so there will be a pole in this expansion. And so you can ask, what is the residue of, uh, of the conformal block in the pr uh, at the pole? Okay. And an important result that I'll try to motivate here is that <coughs> if you take a conformal block, G delta L, are eta in the proximity of the uh, of this pole it behaves like a residue some const some factor r a which does not depend on coordinate it's just, it's just a, a function of delta and l okay. there is there will be the pole delta minus delta star a 
And then there will be er, the, the thing that multiplies this, this, uh, this factor here will be again a conformal block with some dimension delta A, some spin delta LA, which I'll define in a second. Okay? So what I'm saying is, as you approach this, this, this value, delta star A, which, again, is below the unitarity bound, the, the residue of the conformal block is proportional to a conformal block uh, at different dimensions. So this is the conformal block of an operator with dimension delta A and LA. <coughs> and what are these delta A and LA? Well, they are the dimension and the spin of the operator that becomes null. So delta A is the dimension of uh, OA. And generically, because this is, has to be a descendant, it's going to be um, delta A star plus n, okay, some level n, n integer. Um, let me call it n a, okay, n a. And similarly, a is going to be the spin of the operator that becomes null. Okay, and this doesn't have a simple relation. So the reason that this should this is true is first of all, um, you can show that <coughs> the, um, if the op an operator becomes null, is annihilated by k. So some th something that you can show. Something that you can show is that uh, the operator, the generator K mu, annihilates uh, this descendant, this operator null. At, at, okay, so <coughs> this is zero, which implies that this operator not only is a descendant but it's also a primary. And so because it's a primary, uh, you might expect that it has, um, there is a conformal block associated to it. So <coughs> not only you can, you can show this, but you can show that all descendants of A null will, be, uh, will, will have zero norm. So you can show that all descendants of um, on null a have zero norm and in particular uh, if you take a descendant of uh, on null and you compute the norm it will go to zero exactly at the same rate as as on l on null okay so you can show that, for instance, if you take OA null, uh, that's P mu OA null, and you compute the norm. This behaves like uh, <coughs> delta minus delta star 
delta star a times um, times a factor here, sorry. Um, let's put times QA times another, another factor, which is precisely the, the factor needed to reconstruct a com um, so times an, another factor here, which is precisely what would be dictated by conformal invariance. Factor dictated by um, conformal symmetry. Right, because the <coughs> if you want the the norm of a descendant is is uh, determined in terms of the norm of the of the primary by some factor, which is completely determined by conformal symmetry. And so uh, this is this factor. And but on top of that, there is the same rate uh, as the primary. So in a sense, you can always factorize out this term from all, from all the, the norms of all the descendants that become now. And what is left is exactly what you would have had uh, in a for a, for a for a norm for a normal operator. Okay, and so this is one thing. And another thing that you would uh <coughs> so this is what this is why we can put in evidence if you want uh, delta minus delta a, and then whatever is left is a conformal block. And then the only thing that is missing is to determine this uh, this uh, residue R A, which is a, in fact the the right uh, proportion the, the right proportionality in this recursion relation. Ah, I just erased the a formula that I needed. Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll tell you in a second. It's uniquely determined, where the, the location of the poles has been classified. I'll, I'll, I'll write in a second. Um, so the only the only thing that I'm the only ingredient that I'm missing in this uh, in this formula is the precise definition of this R A. So if you look at the formula that you that I just erased, uh, there were sort of three point functions. Um, So this RA comes from uh, from the uh, from the, the the product of the three point function phi three, phi four, uh, O null, then there is the same on the other side, O null. A uh, phi phi one phi two. <coughs> These are three-point functions and can be computed. And then there was the uh, there is the inverse of uh, of the two-point function on all on all. to the minus one. Okay, so this is divided by delta minus delta star. <coughs> so you want to reconstruct this this prefactor taking the limit of this. So I will just call uh, this three point function, I will just call it M A left. This I will call it M a right, and this object here, we have seen it behaves like uh, QA to the minus one, delta minus delta star, delta A star. So um, my residue, our A, 
is just going to be the product of these three things. A left, M A right, Q A to the minus one. So in order to compute these residues, what you have to do, you have to compute the, the norm of the state that become null, strip off the, this, uh, this prefactor delta minus delta A, and this will give you Q. And similarly, you can take uh, the limit of the strip-point function, and will, this will define, for the appropriate dimension, this will define uh, these factors M A left and M A right. So this is in principle is doable and it has been done. So the the expression are uh, slightly complicated, so I'm not going to write it. Um, but what I'm going to write instead is so far we we don't know where this uh, as, it, uh, as it was asked we don't know where these poles are, but uh, if you but people have studied this carefully and using some some representation theory argument they managed to obtain exactly the location of the poles so the poles are of three kinds uh, so a here will be let's say kind one or type 2 and type 3 okay and then depend on some integer n n and for each type um, so these three types depends on how you make contraction of uh, of the translation operator how you contract p mu with different with the different indices okay <coughs> so here um, n it's an integer number, so this, uh, this, this type exists for any n. Here n, it's bounded to be between 1 and L. And in the third case also, n is an integer number, positive integer number. And then for each kind, you can compute the dimensions and um, and the spin of the descendant. Okay, let me just tell you, for instance, what is LA in the different cases. This is L plus N. This is L minus N. So you see different contraction result in different, in in, in different um, uh, different spins. And here L is, LA is again equal to L. And then you can ask, what is the dimension of, what is delta star here? Delta A star, which is the question that was asked before. And <coughs> for instance, in the first case, the dimension is 1 minus L minus N. And you see that it's negative. It's almost, oh, well, it's always below the unitarity bound. In the second case is L plus D minus one minus N. In the third case is D over two minus N. And here, and so this is delta A star, and then you can ask what is the dimension of, of the operator that becomes null, which is delta A star plus NA, and in this case, and a is n, n, and 2n. Okay. So with this table, you can uh, reconstruct precisely. Uh, <coughs> you you can you can identify exactly what is the 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 operate the um, operator or the descendant that becomes null. You can identify the dimension and the spin. Okay. So this is interesting because we we managed to obtain a sort of we, we started understanding the um, analytic properties of these conformal blocks in as a function of delta. Uh, 
And so now, the only thing that we miss is uh, complete this, uh, this analysis of analytic properties. Uh, so to do that, it's convenient to, re to define a fun an auxiliary function which is uh, h instead of g, which is defined like this, for r to the delta, h delta l, r eta. Okay. So this is, it is nicer because if you remember the expansion of the conformal block in terms of um, in the Taylor series in r, there was a prefactor r to the delta. So h here, as an expansion in, in R, which is literally a Taylor expansion. Okay, so H here is, the, uh, is a sum over R to the N, and going from zero to infinity, uh, and then coefficient. So it's literally a Taylor, a Taylor series in the variable R. So it behaves much, much nicer, particularly doesn't have branch cuts, uh, it doesn't have singularities. And so, uh, <coughs> such, a, such a meromorphic function, it's uniquely identified by the poles in, uh, at, uh, as a function of delta now. Uh, it's uh, uniquely identified by the, the poles and the behavior at infinity. Once we know that, uh, we can completely reconstruct this, the, the, the function. The poles, we already know. We have shown uh, this classification gives you all the possible poles of G, and, in uh, and therefore all possible poles of the function H. So the only thing that we're missing is the behavior of, uh, of this function at infinity. So the only thing that we miss is so-called H infinity, L of R and eta, which is the limit delta going to infinity of h delta l uh, r eta. And so this is the only thing that we miss. And how do we define this? A nice way to define this <coughs> is to plug in this definition in the Casimir equation and take the limit delta going to infinity. If you do that, so plug in uh, g equal r delta h delta in the Casimir equation, and <coughs> take the limit delta going to infinity. If you do that, you would see that on, that is on one side you have uh, the Casimir Regen value that scales with delta square. So the only, uh, in order to match this behavior at infinity, you have to keep only terms on the right hand side uh, that, that scales as delta square. And there are fewer terms uh, that scale, there are only few terms that scale as delta square. And this simplifies tremendously the, the form of the differential equation. In particular, it can be completely uh, completely solved in any dimension. Take, take leading terms as And so in that case, you can, so you can completely identify this function h, infinity. It's a very, very simple form, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to write it. <coughs> there is a prefactor, 1 minus r square, 1, mi uh, one minus d over 2. There is this normalization that I defined earlier, 
dl. There is the Gegenbauer polynomial, uh, d, sorry, l, d over 2 minus 1 as a function of eta. And then there is a denominator, which is not that ugly. And for equal external scale dimension, it looks something like this. Um, 1 plus r squared minus 2 eta r to the 1 half. And then there is another one, which is 1 plus r squared plus 2 eta r, again, to the power 1 half. It's not that ugly. So now we have the behavior of the function. So you see that, in particular, this function does not depend on delta, because we took the limit delta going to infinity. It does depend on the spin through this uh, uh, the, the prefactor and the polynomial, the, the Gegenbauer polynomial. But it's very, si and, but it's very simple dependence on, on L. And so now, uh, once we know the behavior at infinity and the pole structure, we can just write an equation that defines the function. So the function h delta l r eta is going to be the function at infinity plus a sum over poles. So you're going to have a sum over all the poles, A equal I n, sorry, type 1 n, type 2 n, type 3 n, okay, all possible poles that appear in that table, R um <coughs> A divided by delta minus delta A, star and then there is the function h again so the re remember the recursion relation was for the conformal blocks but now we have to translate in terms of h which means you have to multiply by um, this this factor r to the delta and so this in terms um, becomes We have a prefactor for r to the power n a, and then the function again evaluated at delta a star plus n a l a as a function of r and eta. Okay, sorry, uh, should have been on the same line. And so there is an important point here uh, in, this, in this equation, which is this. This factor here tells you that whenever you include a pole, you have to, uh, you have a, a, a suppression of this term of factor r to the na. And so, Looking at this equation, this this, uh, this formula, you can see that if you have an initial condition for so this uh, looks remarkably well, this is a recursion relation because if you start from uh, initial answers for the function, you plug it, you you take the initial answers, you plug it, you you just, you, you plug the right value of delta and spin, you plug in here, you read off. Uh, a new a new answers, and then you can plug it back and read off a new a newer answers, and so on and so forth, and eventually you can you can find the stable for the stable point. Okay, um, this if you had an answers. Practically, it's more convenient to start to use as an answers the h infinity function, which we know, and expanded in r. Okay. So let's, let's assume that we start from our initial function, h infinity, expanded to the leading order in R. Uh, you can do this expansion, you get some, something that doesn't even depend on R. 
And, and then you plug this function uh, here. But because of the r to the na, you only, what I want to say is that in order to read off from the, uh, the right-hand side a function at order r to the capital N, because of the suppression, you only need here h computed at order r to the n minus na. Okay, so if you start from uh, an, uh, an expansion in uh, in R to some order, you can use this recursion relation to get an expansion to an, a higher order, and then you can iterate this procedure over and over, and then eventually, <coughs> at each order, you only need um, a finite number of poles because N A increases. Okay with little n. So at any order, you only increase a, a finite number of poles, and you read off the function at higher order in the, in the expansion. Then you take that function, you plug, you plug it back here, and you read off the new function at higher order, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this gives you a completely well-defined algorithm to compute the function h in a, as a power series in R. Okay. Questions? Okay, so this is this method here is actually the method used most commonly in to compute conformal blocks. And I'll show you how it works in the um, in the in the in the tutorial uh, in the next hour. Um, Okay, so I would like to conclude by, uh, with a final remark, which is, okay, so far I've been, <coughs> I've been computing, I mean, I have introduced methods to compute the conformal blocks, but as we will see tomorrow, we don't really need the, the full form of conformal blocks. It would be sufficient to compute Co uh, derivatives of conformal blocks at around some given point uh, with some with a sufficient precision for numerical purposes. Okay. And so, from the expansion that we that we obtain, uh, we can co we, we can compute a power series in R and eta, and then we can take derivatives uh, in R and eta. Notice that in the recursion relation, we start from an initial ansatz, which is a polynomial in eta, and then you take combination of, uh, of polynomial in eta, so you end up always at a given order in R with a polynomial in eta. So the full, the full result will look like a power series in R, and each coefficient of the power series will be a polynomial in eta. And uh, a rational function in the dimension. That's the important point. So if I, I try, to, try to compute the derivative of the conformal block in R with some uh, up to some order n and the derivative in eta up to some order m of the conformal block g delta l Okay, and then I evaluate this derivative at some point that I choose, r star, eta star. Okay. How this will look like? Well, there will be a prefactor for to the r star to the delta, which is always there, times, as I was telling you, <coughs> each coefficient of this expansion is uh, a polynomial in eta, a polynomial in R, and the rational function in delta. So once you take derivatives and, uh, and evaluate R and eta at a special point, the only thing you're left with are uh, rational functions in, um, in, the, in, the, in the dimension. So this will be a polynomial, uh, N, capital N, MN, delta, 
divided by another polynomial, qn delta, plus uh, order r star n minus m, where capital N here is the order of approximation of your uh, conformal blocks. So suppose we have uh, computed the conformal blocks up to order n. So n here n is the maximal, the higher, highest power of r in the h expansion. <coughs> and then when you act with derivatives, sorry, here should be, I think, reverse. Uh, uh, let me change here. N. When you take derivative with respect to n, you decrease the, the order, so um <coughs> the error is not going to be r star to the n, it's going to be r star to, the n, to capital N minus n. And then what are these polynomials? Well, the numerator... Uh, it's going to be some complicated function, but the denominator, you know exactly where the denominator comes from. It comes from a product of all the poles that we have, that we have used in the recursion relation. So in particular, Qn of delta is going to simply be <coughs> the product uh, over A equal type 1 and type 2 and type 3 and with n smaller or equal than capital N of delta minus delta A star. Okay, so it's going to be just a product of this, 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 this poles once you I bring everything together to a common denominator, that's what I get. And interestingly enough, because all the deltas here, all, the, all these delta star A are below the unitarity bound, this denominator here is always positive, okay, which is a very important uh, thing for what c will come next. Okay. Questions about how we use this? We're going to do a practical exercise on this, but uh, if you have questions about the theory, please ask them. Otherwise, let's take 10 minutes break, and then we'll continue with uh, uh, a tutorial. <laughs>